Bone is some of the most amazing living and dynamic tissue in the human body. But when you exercise and your body adapts to that exercise, bone probably isn't the first thing that comes to mind. Often when we think of exercise, we think of it affecting things like muscle, fat, and even things like the heart and cardiovascular system. So in today's video, we're gonna talk about just how important exercise is for your bones and how that bone tissue will actually modify and adapt to that exercise. It's ridiculously amazing. So let's jump right into this bony anatomical awesomeness. So let's start with an example that'll help illustrate why this is so important. When we first started exploring outer space, the early astronauts would return home for their physicals only to find that their bone density had decreased as much as 20% in some cases. Now that was obviously quite alarming, seeing as how they were in prime physical condition prior to leaving, but this helped us to learn something very important in regards to bone tissue. Bone is constantly changing and adapting to the stress placed upon it. So if you spend an extended period of time in a zero gravity environment, that bone's gonna change and adapt by decreasing its bone density, kind of like a use it or lose it situation. But that also means that exercise and physical activity plays a huge role in maintaining and even increasing bone density. Exercise doesn't just cause the bone to increase its density. Bone will also adapt by changing its shape and its internal architecture. So let's take a look at some of these amazing features of bone so we can figure out what's actually happening with these adaptations and changes. And of course, get into how muscles and the various forms of exercise play a role in this. If we were to take a look at a bone in the human body, we would see that that bone is made up of two types of bone tissue, compact bone tissue and spongy bone tissue. Compact bone is the dense outer portion of all bones. So everything you're seeing on the outside of this bone is the compact bone, and that compact bone can get pretty thick in the shafts of the long bone, especially if you take a look at where we cut into this tibia or shin bone here, you can see how thick that compact bone can get. But deep to this compact bone is the spongy bone. And just taking a look at that picture, you can see, kind of looks like a sponge. But look how cool the real spongy bone is. You can see all these tiny little beams of bone, and those little beams are called trabeculae, which actually conveniently translates to little beam. But this is also why spongy bone is known as trabecular bone as well. Now these trabeculae, what's really ridiculously awesome about them is that at first glance, they may look that their shape and their orientation is random, but that is not the case. The shape, the orientation, the architecture of these trabeculae, if you will, they are aligned in the direct lines of stress that your bones have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Think how amazing that is. Just like somebody building a building with support beams and scaffolding, your bones do the same thing and orient these little beams to deal with the forces that your bones get to see on a day-to-day -day basis. So what types of activities and exercise helps to increase bone density and maintain this architecture? And really important, what is it that's inside the bone that is adapting to these activities. As far as activities and exercises, we need to do things that both push and pull on the bones, or in other words, expose the bones to both compressive and tensile forces. Now you might be thinking, that seems like a little bit of an oversimplification. I just need to push and pull on my bones and I'm good. Well, this is important because of what the bone tissue is actually made of and how this stuff's going to adapt. There are two very different substances inside of bone tissue an organic substance that gives bone its tensile strength and an inorganic substance that gives bone its compressive strength. Both of these substances we want the bone to adapt and increase more of, hence this pushing and pulling. So let's talk about what these two substances are and then how this would apply to the exercises. If we were to zoom into bone tissue, even between the cells, we would see these two components or substances that make up the bone tissue. The inorganic substance would be a hard crystal-like substance called hydroxyapatite. Now that's kind of a funny name, but this hydroxyapatite is made up of mostly calcium and phosphate. That's why calcium is so important to the health of your bones. It's used to make this hydroxyapatite, which gives bone its hard characteristic and its ability to resist those pushing or compressive forces. The organic component of bone is actually collagen. Collagen will bond and form this intimate relationship with the hydroxyapatite, and collagen fibers are these string-like proteins that resist being pulled apart. And so think of it as this microscopic rope that can bend and be flexible, but resist that tensile force or being pulled apart and therefore gives bone its tremendous tensile strength. 
So when it comes to the exercises for bone health, none of these exercises are going to mean much without consistency. We need to be willing to consistently stimulate the bone tissue in order to gain and maintain these long-term adaptations. And with all this talk about consistency and exercise, I think it's a good time for me to take a second to say thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Copilot. Copilot is a fitness company that has created one of the best systems to help people start and stick with their fitness goals. And when I say stick with their fitness goals, I mean that Copilot has 75% of their clients continuing to work out after 100 days. That's just amazing to think about. And I think a lot of the success is due to their focus on consistency and quality of life changes rather than some instant transformation. Copilot is all about what you can do today and how you can make progress with consistency over time. You are also working with real people at Copilot and that is one of my favorite things about it. Like me, you'll get matched with one of their expert coaches, have a video call with them where you can discuss your goals and get a customized fitness plan based on those goals. I had specific goals that I wanted to accomplish with my running as well as my strength. So I had specific running and strength training workouts uploaded to the app and I could track those on my Apple Watch as well as on my phone. It was super easy and convenient to use. The communication is also convenient as you continually get to communicate with your coach through the Copilot app and of course, get feedback and track your progress. And I think some other things that can really help someone continue to exercise is having a flexible system combined with accountability. And Copilot definitely provides that. It also doesn't hurt that Copilot was just named one of the best personal trainer apps of 2022 by Forbes. So if you're interested in trying Copilot, go to go.mycopilot.com slash Institute of Human Anatomy and they'll give you 14 days free with your own expert fitness and health coach. We'll also put that link in the description below. So finally, back to these exercises that could stimulate the bones with both compressive and tensile forces. So usually how I go about this is I'll ask students, can you come up with some ideas that would put a pushing or a compressive force on the bones? And usually the students will answer that pretty quickly. They'll say things like walking, running, and jumping. And those are definitely correct answers. Those would put a pushing or a compressive force on the bone. Obviously running and jumping being more intense and creating a greater stimulus than say like walking. But then I'll say, what about a pulling force? Can you think of activities or exercises that would create a pulling force on the muscle? And they often will think a little bit longer about that, but usually come up with things like resistance training, maybe like a pull-up or a biceps curl. And so let's use the biceps curl as an example, and we'll use my biceps, forgive me, my, I'm not a very big specimen here, but this is where my biceps is. And when the biceps muscle belly contracts, the tendon of the biceps would attach down to the bone, and as that muscle belly contracts, that tendon would yank on the bone and create a pulling force on the actual bone. And so you can see those are pretty straightforward examples, but the interesting thing about that is it's actually even easier than you think. You don't have to get very creative to put both a compressive and a tensile force on the bones. And let me explain why. So let's say we're all out together frolicking in the forest and we're picking up sticks and breaking and snapping sticks. So instead I'll use Cornelius's radius here, thank you Cornelius, and I'm going to bend it. Don't worry, it's not going to snap. Cornelius is a synthetic skeleton, although Jeffrey over here to the left is losing his mind because his bone would snap if we did this. But I want you guys to look at that bone. The top part of that bone would be being pulled apart or under a tensile force, if you could see that. Whereas the bottom part of that bone would be under a compressive or being smooshed together, a compressive force. So apply that to a biceps curl. Yes, that biceps tendon is going to yank on the bone there, but think about the weight trying to push downward. This would create that bending or bowing. Now, granted, it doesn't really bend because the bone's strong enough to resist this, but the forces would create a tensile force on the top and a compressive force on the bottom. Also think about that with something like running. We go to our femurs here. Notice that the femurs are actually angled inward, and that's even a little bit more dramatic on, say, like a female pelvis. But because of that angling inward, the femur, every time you step, it would kind of create that bowing force. Again, doesn't bow in real life because the bone's strong enough to do, deal with that usually. And we're gonna have that outside of the bone dealing with a tensile force with the inside of the bone dealing with a compressive force. So as you can see, the majority of the activities that you would choose to participate in in an exercise program would actually do a pretty good job at stimulating the bones in both ways. So what do we do with all this information and the details we just talked about? Well, one, it's pretty cool just to learn more about the human body, but I will concede I'm a little biased to that. But two, we pretty much just went over the idea that the majority of exercises that you can choose from will stimulate the bones with both compressive and tensile forces. So do we really need to get lost in the details of exercise choices? Like, does it matter if we do a biceps curl versus a chin-up? 
or say like, do we have to actually pound the pavement with running, or are there other ways to stimulate this? And the answer is, there are multiple ways to do this, as you are probably already have guessed. And so what the main focus is, is these general principles. Now granted, you can get nuanced with different type of exercise choices based upon strength goals and other type of fitness goals, but when it comes to bone health, with muscular training or resistance training, you want to do something that's at least a moderate level of intensity. So like if you could curl a weight like 25 times, it's probably not intense enough. You could probably increase the intensity a bit, which would mean increase the weight. And this is still a little bit of a wide range, but I kind of live in this area of like, say, something that's you could lift six to even up to 12 times. Obviously, if you pick a weight that you could only lift six times, you're going to increase the intensity and the stimulus and obviously kind of build more of go into that strength training realm. But six to 12 reps, you would tend to get a benefit there with increasing and maintaining bone density. The other question is, would you have to actually pound the pavement and run? Does running provide a stimulus? Absolutely. Runners who don't lift a lot of weights will actually have great bone density in their lower limbs. Now, ideally, I think it's great to have a combination of both. Some sort of endurance training mixed with weight training. Now, if people don't love running, compare that to say like a cyclist. Cycling doesn't create a lot of impact and pounding on the pavement. But you would be hard pressed to say find a cyclist that didn't have good bone density. So we're kind of answering our question here. You don't have to pound the pavement. Granted, it creates a great stimulus. But you could simulate that through say like squats, deadlifts, really contracting those lower limb muscles to pull on those lower limb bones, as well as, as, well as also create that kind of bending and compressive and tensile force that we talked about earlier today. Now also keep in mind, if you're going to kind of lean towards the weight training area, I think again this is good for everybody, you want to balance the whole body. You want to uh, train all the muscle groups of the upper limb, the lower limb, as well as your trunk and core muscles. So let's wrap this up with some final cool details as well as a point of clarification. I just want to be clear that we know that the bones are constantly being remodeled regardless of the amount of exercise you're doing. The bones are constantly having old bone tissue be resorbed and then new bone tissue being laid down in its place. So constantly turning over the bone tissue. And there's some really cool bone cells that get involved in this. One of the cells is called an osteoblast and the osteoblast build up or lay down new bone tissue. Essentially prepare that matrix of collagen and hydroxyapatite. The other cell called the osteoclast will actually resorb or break down bone tissue. So you have these two cell types that kind of oppose each other. So if you think about it this way, the osteoblast and the osteoclast, if they're pacing each other or that their activity matches, your bone density will stay the same. Say somebody decides to start exercising though and the osteoblasts start outpacing the osteoclasts, bone density would go up. Go back to that example of the astronauts earlier. No physical activity where they're not putting a lot of stress and strain on the bone, those osteoclasts would outpace the osteoblasts and bone density would go down. So kind of interesting to see those different cell types and how they're active throughout this whole process. Now one thing that's really interesting, kind of a little bit of a food for thought or a little teaser for a future video, estrogen tends to inhibit those osteoclasts. And so think about that from the female perspective as far as what would happen during a certain time of their life if estrogen levels were to go down. But we'll save that for another video and touch on that a little bit later. But thanks for watching everyone. If you're interested in checking out Copilot, that link is in the description below. As always, we love reading your comments. Go ahead and throw some of those comments in about what you think estrogen and the osteoclast relationship might do. Like and subscribe if you feel the need. And of course, we'll see you in the next video.